Tonight's guest is Monty Tickle. Monty, welcome to the show. Thank you. You're welcome. We appreciate your time. Monty, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. I was raised in the country uh, most of my life, up until I was about 17, 18 years old. My mother and father were pretty hardworking individuals, but a lot of the times they would uh, have to work late. So me and my little brother, Rob, we used to go out into the woods to play. And that's basically how my childhood went up until about 17 years old or so. Myself... I've worn many hats in my years of working. I don't have a clear profession, but if I was to look at all my skills and put them all together, I would say that construction would probably be the top with art and digital graphics, making T-shirts. I mean, just anything artsy. Music. uh, I've been a musician for most of my life. From the time I was 10 years old, got my first guitar and till today and 42 now. So that's a good 32 years of musicianship under my belt. As far as like bio goes, that's about it. Currently, I live in the woods. <laughs> I live in a small town in Southwest Virginia and uh, I have a fiance and two step kids and i've got four kids of my own that are grown and um i work at a cemetery (laughs) but that's about it sounds to me like you've carved out a good life for yourself it's pretty comfortable yeah sounds like it is that's great monty you had your first encounter when you were just 16 and it was a traumatic one do you think that experience had any profound effects on the person you are today Well, I can say this. Up until yesterday, or the day before, I think is what it was, I I have not set foot in the woods. I used to go out there for entertainment. Me and my brother didn't have a whole lot growing up. So, you know, the woods were kind of our thing. And after that encounter happened, I had a lot of nightmares. Uh, I had nightmares for years. And still, you know, to this day, when I talk about it, in full and 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 i take myself back to those those memories uh it it basically just floods over me and um as much as the conscious side of my mind wants to push that out and kind of block that out the subconscious of my mind when i go to sleep uh, becomes very active and you know i i all I all I can do is, you know, just try try to get try to get better and better and talk about this thing. And 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 the more that I talk about it, uh, the more that I can I can I can deal with this thing, you know. And uh, and the less and less over the years, it's it, it's it's diminished. You know, I, I've had nightmares. I've had um, I, I I can't have people jump scare me i mean like the those kind of pranks and stuff will i don't i don't want to say that i i would but you know you might get punched <laughs> if you if you jump scare me you know that's how bad it got uh it's gotten actually and i've had some therapy over it i mean it's been a pretty profound thing in my life just up until a couple of days ago and Uh, You and I had to talk and everything uh, was the first time I've entered the woods by my own volunteerism. So that's pretty much it. I don't know of anything else that it really affects. Well, let me actually um, rephrase that. There are several other things that it affects in I think anybody that has one of these encounters would be affected the same way. And I think distrust, paranoia is the big thing that 
I know that I go through. I'm sure that other people that's had these experiences have those similar feelings. But as far as a whole, it, it hasn't it hasn't so much as made me to the point to where I can't deal with life, but it has affected things to where it's been harder. Life is hard enough as it is, not to mention after you have two encounters. So, yeah, I don't like hearing that at all. When you went to see a therapist, when you underwent therapy, who did you go to see and how much did you tell them about what really happened to you? Well, the first encounter is is the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm most focused on because it was the most traumatic. It's just a counselor that I talked to. I'm not currently talking to one, but it was for about five years afterwards. Uh, my mother and father noticed that uh, I wouldn't go outside. Uh, they noticed a huge, they knew, noticed a huge change, you know, in my, my behavior. And my, my mom uh, asked me one day if she thought that it would be okay if I would talk to some, you know, to someone. And, and I said, well, sure, you know, and she set me up with uh, a counselor from her church that she went to. And it was more of like a program, like a big brother kind of program. And he was a little bit older than me. And he would come to the house, you know, once a week and we would kind of talk about things. And it took me a while to, to really get down to it just, just because I didn't feel like he was going to believe any of it. But we did sit down and talk and I eventually got the story out in the full form. And the counselor, he had kind of a, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but it was almost a, a, a double-edged sword. Like it, it, it kind of, it almost like seems like he didn't believe me in a, in a sense, but altogether it was a nice release because I was afraid to tell anybody else. I mean, my mother and father knew about it. And my father that night that that it happened, you know, we talked about it and we'll get into that a little bit later. But that's pretty much it with the uh, counseling. I did it for about five years and, and then I felt like uh, the nightmares and everything were subsiding. So I chose to, to stop the counseling then. Well, I can't say I blame you if he didn't believe you. I'm glad that you were able to get that out. But yeah, if he didn't believe you, then how can he help you all that much? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, definitely. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. All right, Monty, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Well. I was 16. We had just gotten out of high school for break. I think I was in the 10th grade. And it was about a month to a month and a half after we got out of break. So it was actually, I, I guess it was more towards the uh, beginning of the uh, the fall semester. But uh, I do remember that there were leaves coming down but not as much as say full fledged fall it was it was more of like at the end of summer where they just start changing and you got a few leaves coming off here and there but they were really beautiful colors up there you know in southwest virginia we we have some very very beautiful colors coming out in autumn and fall but it was me my little brother and uh, we had a best friend at that time that had moved from, uh, I think what he told us was um, Pensacola, Florida. I, I, I can't really remember where he told us he was from, but I do remember that he said that he was from a city. He had never been out into the country. He had never been up to this part of uh, the United States, uh, the East Coast, or the mountains, you know, and he was really interested in going camping. And um, 
like I said, I, I was 16. My brother, my little brother, his name was Rob. He was 13. And uh, John, he was a year older than I was. So he was 17. So it's me, my little brother, Rob, and John. I remember us talking in school and uh, us planning on a camping trip. And we went ahead and planned it for the weekend. Well, before I get into that, I'll kind of paint you a picture of the lay of the land. The lay of the land was like this. My mother and father had bought a double wide. And on the side of a hill, down in a holler, my dad, he's, uh, his specialty was actually cutting building pads out of the side of mountains and doing uh, road dirt work and stuff like that. And later on in my life, that's what I learned how to do. But um, if you can imagine looking down a valley and one on the right side of the valley, you cut a backwards L out of the side of that mountain, and that's where we placed our double wide. Now, behind our double wide was kind of steep, and at that point, our double wide had only been there about a year or year and a half, maybe not even that long. But I do remember that the dirt, there was still no foliage or plants or anything growing up directly behind the double wide going up the mountain. Well, up the mountain behind our, our double wide was the camping spot. And me and my brother had gone up there and scouted out a couple times. And we had actually went up there a few times and, and camped. And we'd never had anything happen up there. Uh, nothing suspicious, anything like that. So if you went down the road, the main road, it's called Hollow Road off of uh, Route 460, you'll go down a, a, a hill into this holler, and it basically just goes straight, and then it down an incline, and then it levels out. You go about a quarter to a half a mile, maybe three quarters of a mile down that road, and then if you look to the right, the road that you're driving on is on the left side of the valley. And the valley, you know, as you're driving, uh, you would take a right to go down into our driveway. And our driveway went down and it meandered to the right just a bit. And it had a circular driveway that my mom and dad really, really was proud of. (laughs) But behind that to the left was an old logging road or uh, an access road to something. And it went up to the top of the mountain. Uh, it had been grown over a little bit, but um, there were some saplings and some longer grass, taller grass that uh, kind of covered it. But you could still see the pathway of where the two wheels of something had went up and down that thing quite a few times. So from my double wide, if you went up that trail or that path, uh, little road, it's basically all woods, and it's very dense. Uh, you probably go uh, half a mile to three quarters of a mile up this. Pretty, I mean, it's not. It's it's pretty steep, but it's not steep enough to where you couldn't drive, say, a four by four up. So we decided that was probably a good way to get to the spot that we were going. And once you got to the top of that, there was a clearing. It was um, probably, I would say approximately a hundred yard radius of clearing. And we just called it the bald spot. I mean, it's just what we called it. So once you kind of get that in your mind, just imagine at the, at the top of this mountain, there's a, there's a clearing and there's a road that connects that clearing all the way down that kind of meanders down the mountain, down to our driveway. And we never used to, it for like automobiles or anything like that but we definitely um, used it for the for scouting and i think my dad had taken me squirrel hunting up there once or twice too and uh it, it was just a cool place that me and my brother used to hang out when things got rough in the house if mom and dad were you know arguing or something you know we, we'd go up there and hang out it wasn't went a very far hike but it was some place that we just liked but anyway so On this day of the encounter, uh, my friend uh, rode the bus home with us. 
we were all attending summer school at that point. And I can't remember if it was just a half a day that we went or I, I don't think it was a whole day, but it was just a few hours. I think to just get there. I think the whole, whole reason why my mom and dad even made us go was to get, get us out of their hair. But I remember we either got off of the bus or his grandmother brought John over there. I, to be honest with you, I cannot remember which one it was. But anyway, he got there. We planned our trip pretty well. We got all three tents. We had separate tents. We made sure we had our, our hot dog skewers. And when I say hot dog skewers, I'm, I'm not saying the traditional ones that you can buy at Walmart. Talk about ones that we carved. So we got those, got a football, got some things, and we started up the hill. And I just remember uh, looking at my brother. You know, he's having a tough time. He was a little hefty back then, and he's having kind of a tough time going up the mountain. And the sweat was just bubbling off of his forehead. <laughs> Poor little guy. But um, we finally got got up to the spot. And um, I would say it was probably 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the evening by the time we got there. And we uh, had previously built a fire pit with some rocks. And to this day, I don't know if this is connected or not, but every single time that we went up there and we went to that spot, our fire pit was messed up. Something or someone had come up there and moved those rocks around to the point to where we had to go find them again or find new ones and build the pit all over again. So I remember when we first got there, we uh, put our tents up, uh, made our uh, sleeping bags, and rebuilt the fire pit. Well, by that time, it was starting to get dark. So we all three kind of went our separate ways and we all went out to get kindling and wood for the fire. And we all voted that it would be my responsibility to feed the fire all night. Um, not sure how that, how I lost that vote, but <laughs> I was the guy that, that, uh, that had to feed the fire. So, uh, so behind my tent was the wood pile. And from there on, that, then on out, we, we passed the football around a little bit, told some jokes, laughed, you know, just cutting up, being teenagers. And um, it became nighttime. And I would say 10 o'clock, maybe 1030, we're all sitting around the fire, and we have our hot dogs on our little carved skewers. I remember my brother had one hot dog on his. I had two on mine. John had two on his. I, I'm pretty sure that was the right number. Well, either John or my brother Rob mentioned, hey, you think you might want to get some firewood? And I was like, sure, okay, I'll, I'll grab some. So I put my stick down with my hot dog put it on the little little branch that looked like a Y, you know, kind of almost like a fishing pole thing. But anyway, I went back, uh, picked up some logs, a uh, couple of them about, I don't know, maybe wrist diameter, probably three or four of those. And as soon as I raised up, something came through the, the foliage, and I thought it was an acorn. Now, why an acorn would be flying sideways, I, I really don't know, but we were very used to the acorns falling in that part of the forest there. And uh, you, you would hear them all the time hit the leaves, you know, the, the sound of it. So I raised up, and like I said, uh, something came by me, and it was probably a good foot, foot and a half to the right of me, in between the tent and me. Now, I'm facing the fire, and our tent configuration is, imagine a circle in the middle, that's your fire pit, and in a triangle shape, 
was each of our tents. And uh, whatever that was that came through, it went straight into the fire. So it came through, it came by my head, it hit a bunch of foliage, sounded, and then it, it hit the fire. So I'm thinking instantly, somebody's up here messing with us. And the first person that came to my mind was my father. <laughs> he was kind of a prankster. Every every now and then, he would pull a little prank here and there, give us a little scare, take us out for, you know, doing snipe hunting and stuff like that. He was kind of a prankster. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, my dad's behind the bushes over there throwing rocks or something at us, you know. So I, I turn around, and I'm like, hey, all right now. I was like, who's over there messing with us? And nobody answered. And I'm like, hmm. Okay, so I turned back around and my brother kind of had this little look on his face like, what was that, you know? And uh, I took about two steps and on my second step, right before my, my foot hit the ground, here another thing comes from the same direction, from behind my tent in the bushes, passed in between my tent and my head. This time it was closer. And it came through the foliage, hit a couple leaves, and then this time it hit beside the fire. It wasn't in the fire. We, so this time we could tell what it was, and it was a rock. It was a rock probably as big as a golf ball, and I would say that it was very fresh, picked out, freshly picked out of the ground. Because when I kind of looked at it or whatever, I was still kind of frozen. But I could see it. It was right there in front of me. And you could see the new dirt on it. I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is this? That's not an acorn. That's a rock. Somebody is definitely throwing stuff at us. Somebody's up here messing with us. So I started to turn my head towards where the rock came from. And I didn't get all the way around when this, whatever this thing was, made a scream that I mean this is this is the things that those nightmares were made of. Like this is the beginning of them. You know, you always always hear the scream and then something's chasing us. But this scream, and if you can imagine the only reference I can really give the listeners here is if you've ever seen a Jurassic Park movie and heard the T-Rex yell out that that bellowing, very deep, but kind of, uh, I don't know, that scream that it does. Now, if you was to pair that with the low frequencies of, like, say, a gator. Now, if you've ever heard a gator do a grumble, those things are super low and even has, I've heard that infrasound, it can uh, produce infrasound, which is a very low frequency that not many humans, well, I don't think any humans can hear it, but uh, super low frequency that causes all kinds of different um, side effects on people. But there it went from the low grumble to this loud high pitch siren almost sound that like basically just moved everything inside my 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 body like every organ it shook it if you can imagine i've been to a couple really loud concerts in my lifetime being a musician <laughs> my dad took me to a few when i was a kid but the loudest one that i'd ever been to was a metallica concert in roanoke 1999 we were sitting up on the top row and the group that i was with decided to go down onto the floor where the general admission people were so we went down there and made our our way all the way to the stage and the way metallica does it is their stage is in the middle but their subwoofers they put them in that middle stage to where the closer you get the 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 harder you can feel that rumble and that bass hit and i'm telling you what when i was down there at that concert that bass was hitting me pretty hard and it was making me feel sick even but it does not hold a candle to the sound and the rumble that this thing like made 
you know, to us. And I would say that this thing was at least by the volume and by kind of just where it was or whatever, I would say it was at least 25 yards away. Maybe closer. I I doubt it because I couldn't see it, but it was pitch black out there. So I'm not really sure. Uh, I never did see this thing, but it was loud. Uh, and it probably, the duration was probably eight to 10 seconds. And I'm talking about full blown lung capacity bellowing out this siren scream that, I mean, it took me by surprise. I mean, it changed my whole life, that scream did. But back to the story, after the scream was done, well, during the scream, I'm sorry, during the scream, probably halfway through, I looked to my left to see if my brother was okay and just to look at him. And his face looked like, I mean, white as a sheet of paper. And John was like creeping up, like getting up from his position, like creeping towards the road, like in a very slow manner. And then as this thing kind of tapered off and it stopped, we could kind of hear the bushes or something moving and... I immediately went straight to my brother, grabbed his hand, and my thought process was, we've got to, I've got to get my brother away from this thing. Like, at this point, like, I wasn't even thinking about myself. I just wanted to get my little brother away from it. And the best thing that I, I knew how to do was go from point A to point B. And that was straight down the hill. That's not, you know, that's not hitting that little access road because that little access road was probably 30, 40 yards from where camp was. Maybe closer. Well, no, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. That, that was, or let me re say that it was at least, tw- it was about 20, 25 yards away. It was closer than, uh, than what I thought, but it, it seemed like it was a long way away uh, at at that point. And, and it, I figured if we tried to go for the access road, it had a lot of clearing that, you know, no, no trees to like kind of have to juke around or anything. It had a lot of clearing to close the distance between it and us. So instead of going down that access road, we I turned directly left and started down this dark black hill that we couldn't see anything. So I've got my arm, my left arm, up over my face and my brow trying to keep the, the branches from from hitting my eyeballs and stuff and putting my eyes out and my other hand, my right hand was around my brother's wrist as tight as it would go, dragging him down this hill. Now there was a few times where we had been exploring up on that, that hill and we had found this old, uh, rusted barbed wire, uh, fence, uh, partially intact. It wasn't, uh, wasn't fully intact. It, it was very old. Um, if I was to say run into one of the posts or just grab it and push it a little bit, it would probably break. That's how old this thing was, but it was still there and there was still parts of it there and there was parts of it that was intact and parts of it that wasn't intact. And the only thing that I'm thinking going down this hill is number one, get away from this thing. Number two, hold on to my brother. And number three, don't run into the barbed wire fence. Well, I'll pause on the story right there and tell you about the creature. Okay, so that that's our position in the story. So let's rewind. And the creature, whatever this thing was uh, that was behind us. Okay, so it was it was in the bushes. It threw the rocks. It it let out that crazy. I don't scream, growl, siren thing. And we could hear it coming towards us. Like the, the instance, instant we heard 
it rustle in the bushes uh coming towards us like it that that was our instinct to leave but from then on like every time that we would fall down there was a a period of like almost silence and you could hear this thing stomping down the mountain and and breaking trees coming after us like uh, i don't want to say I, I don't know how far it was behind us but we fell several times but we instantly got back up and kept running and this thing you could feel almost uh, you could almost feel the footfall um this thing was heavy uh whatever it was it was very heavy and you could hear a very labored breathing with almost like a touch of pneumonia uh if you can imagine that like uh, if you breathe if you're very congested in your chest uh hopefully you don't ever get sick in the future but if you do blow all your air out and about <laughs> three quarters away you'll start getting this really really uh I don't know, just rough, like breathing, like you got, like, like it's very congested breathing. But that's what we could hear was this congested breathing. And every now and then it would kind of huff, like, <sighs> you know, but, um, mostly it was the breathing. It didn't growl or make any other kind of noise besides that one or two little huffs it did. Uh, but it was on our tail and. So we're going down the mountain and it comes up to the point to where I need to start looking for this fence, but I don't want to slow down. Uh, and I don't want to let go of my brother. My brother is screaming and crying at this point. I've literally dragged him down the mountain. Um, his, his shins were all scraped up. Uh, well, anyway, so we get to the point where we're, we're at that fence where, or where I thought the fence was. And, um, I thought there was an opening and there was, but we didn't quite clear it. Well, I, I cleared it. My brother's knee didn't, uh, his knee caught one of the barbs or something and it, it ripped it open pretty, pretty awful. And, um, now I didn't know that at the time and I don't think he did either. Just because of the whole, you know, the whole experience and us being chased at that point. And, and the adrenaline was just, I mean, going through our veins like water, you know. Um, but we eventually came, came down to the opening where, and if you could imagine, again, where I, at the beginning, where I, I was explaining how Dad cut that backwards L out of the, uh, out of the mountain, just a just imagine a from the top right, like if you're looking at a say a computer monitor, all right, look at the top right corner and just draw a diagonal line all the way down to the lower left corner, and then within that line you've got the top half, which is you know your air sky whatever uh, space, and then you got ground on the lower half. Now, if you take a backwards L right in the middle of that and just cut a backwards L two or three inches down, two or three inches over. That is what the building pad looked like. And the right side of the horizontal, I'm sorry, the vertical um, L was slanted a bit because, you know, obviously you can't have like a, just a cliff behind your house. So dad had kind of, um, I uh, skimmed it off and trimmed it off to where it was almost uh, almost straight up and down, but you could get up and down it if you were like on your hands and knees, like, you know, crawl. But you could basically crawl up this thing, but it got steeper as it went down. So, like, when we hit that clearing, the tree stopped, we started sliding down the uh, the dirt or whatever, and then basically just, like, kept kept sliding and kept sliding until we hit the bottom. And um, at one point, I had to put my brother on my back. Um, it was right there before we came out of the clearing. Uh, but I let him down, and we went down the, the dirt. 
we ran around the left side of the from the back to the front of the double wide. We had our deck, so we had to run up the deck. And while we were running up the deck, here comes John around the other their, their other end. I thought we'd lost him. I only thought of him one time during that whole trip down the mountain, and that and that was when I'd looked at him and seen him creeping away. I didn't see him after that. He just disappeared. So later on, though, he told me that he had taken that access road and just ran down the road. <laughs> so if you could imagine, we got there faster than he did, you know, and we're going through trees and everything else. And he's he's just going down a road with like little saplings and stuff. He, You know, you would have thought that he would have made it there first. But no, we got there first and then he showed up two or three seconds later, but still that kind of gives you an idea of like how fast we're going down that that mountain. And we beat on the door. My brother was crying. He's crying, please, please hurry up. You know, please hurry up. Open the door, please. I'm screaming, open the door. Doors locked, obviously. I guess they had uh, an adult night without us there and didn't expect us back. Finally, my dad came to the door and opened the door up and we all kind of ran by him or whatever and and fell down the, in the middle of the floor and he's like what in the world is going on with you guys and and for five or ten minutes i couldn't even catch my breath to even tell him my brother's just sitting there screaming and crying holding his knee john is in the floor also uh he, he's crying at this point just sitting there rocking back and forth and dad just keeps asking us like what's going on what's going on and i finally got it out and told him what happened and he you know i love i loved my dad a lot you know but he 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 could be naive sometimes and he you know we told him that story and obviously his two sons and their friend was sitting there in the middle of the floor I mean, completely freaked out. Something had happened to us. At least, you know, he, he know, he knew that, but, but no, instead he gave us a little giggle and said, Oh, it's probably just a bear. Oh, okay. Probably just a bear. It was not a bear. I'm telling you right now, a bear does not have the lung capacity and neither does anything else that I know of animal wise. Uh, to, to put out a scream like that. And then nothing that I know of that is in this area, predator or not, is heavy enough to produce the footfall and, and breaking all those trees down as it was coming down the mountain. There's nothing I know of that can do that. Nothing. But eventually dad got us calmed down. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to give him some details and he just seemed like he just didn't believe us. So my bedroom was facing the direction that we came down the hill. Uh, I'm sorry. My bedroom, uh, window was, uh, my bedroom was also on that same side, but the bedroom window and my bed was right beside of it. And when it was time to, quote unquote go to bed i did not want to go to bed but um but back it up just a uh just a, a tad right after we told my dad what had happened he gave us that little giggle and laugh and this and that and uh, it, it, it just it bothers me in this day that he he didn't believe us you know but uh but anyway um he said well who well so you guys came down off that mountain. You didn't put the fire out. And I said, really, that's what you're worried about? The fire? He's like, well, somebody's got to go up there and put that fire out. And he said, uh, one of you guys are going with me. So, um, he pretty much chose me and it was my responsibility. I had invited, invited John up, up there. And it was, you know, I was the one who, uh, curated this whole, camping trip so it was my responsibility to go with him well he finally got me to to agree but i told him i said i'm not getting out so we got a five gallon bucket he filled it up with water from a spigot there outside we got into his old f-150 and we put it in granny gear and went up the access road 
Now, if you can imagine on this access road, now when you go up, go up this mountain, the clearing, the bald spot is going to be on your right as you pull up. Well, I'm on that side. I'm in the passenger side, you know, uh, F-150. It, it's not a crew cab, not an extended cab. It's just a that seat, that one seat that goes across. So it's me and my dad. And my dad had grabbed his, uh, I'd noticed he'd grabbed his uh, 357 Magnum, or maybe not a Magnum, I'm not really sure. It had a long barrel on it, had a camo grip. Pretty nice gun. I wish, wish I had it. <laughs> uh, now, but I noticed he had that, and uh, I would slid down in the seat. I didn't, I didn't want to see out the window or anything else. And I finally noticed that we'd come up to the top, and uh, he said, Money, you gonna get out? And I said, Please, Dad, don't make me. Please don't make me. I begged him, I, I did not want to get out of that truck. He said, All right, so he grabbed his gun and he put it in his right hand, and with his left hand, he grabbed the bucket out of the back of the truck and if you can imagine a little kid in their bed at night you know uh it's all dark and they got the, the covers pulled up over their nose just below their eye that's kind of what i was i was looking like peeking up over the door panel at the campsite you know i'm just kind of scanning my you know from left to right you know, trying to figure out this thing's still out there you know and and i'm begging dad I, i'm telling him i'm saying dad please hurry Please hurry. Please get back in this truck. I don't want you to get hurt. Please, God. Well, at that point, he goes around. He takes the bucket and he throws it on there onto the fire. But before he does, I'm looking at our homemade skewers out there and not one hot dog was left on the on those things and if you remember at the at the first i had two my brother had one john had two that's five that's five hot dogs total and nobody had taken any bites out of them because where they were still cooking while uh the rock was thrown at us and at that point you know when we started running down the the mountain we dropped them like i mean well mine was on the little uh, the little fishing pole holder Y kind of deal. And my brother and John dropped them and they just left. We left. Well, when I was looking, scanning from left to right, there was no hot dogs on that, on that thing. I don't know if that's connected or not. Um, I, I don't want to, to reach and say, Oh yeah, that's gotta be, that's gotta be it. You know, that's, that's what he was after the hot dogs, you know, nah. I don't believe so. Uh, but I mean, it could have been something else. Could have been something else, but it was awful suspicious that those things were gone. Well, so to continue the story, my dad, he, uh, he dumped the, the bucket, uh, put the fire out, got back in the truck. We went back down to the house. Uh, we talked a little bit and he told me right before I got out of the truck not to tell anybody about this. Um, I don't remember if when we talked the other day, I told you that or not, but I did remember that detail. He told me not to tell anybody about this. And I said, okay, dad. And that was the last we ever spoke of it. And my brother that night went to the hospital, got some stitches in his knee and me and John or John and I, we, uh, we spent the night in the living room because I refused to go and sleep in my room with that window facing the, the, the hill, the, the mountain. I didn't want to see what that was. I didn't want to look out that window in the middle of the night, waking up and see a face in the window. I didn't, you know, I didn't want that. And uh, probably for the next two weeks, I stayed out on the couch just because of that until my mom made me uh, go back in there and stay. But, uh, but that's it. That's, that is that in, in, encounter. Okay. Second encounter. My dad had met a, a lady and uh, had gotten together with her after my mom and dad's divorce, which was when I was, uh, it was after that encounter. Uh, but he had met a lady and she had lived in Salem. Uh, 
and we moved there first. Uh, it was about an hour away. It was, uh, it's about 10 minutes out of Roanoke, uh, Roanoke being one of the bigger landmarks and cities around where we live there. Um, and eventually he, um, he went out, he played a lot of pool at night. So he met this guy that, uh, owned some property and, um, he wanted to, to be able to go to that property and move to that property. But before we could, there were some people in that house that, uh, the lease uh, hadn't expired yet. Uh, so we had to find a month to month place to kind of, uh, to live there until we got to that, that place that he wanted to go. Um, and it was, uh, and we found a place and it was called Snug Harbor. Now, um, you can look at, look this up on Google Earth. And, uh, if you find Manita, Virginia, uh, you'll find, um, Route 122 going from, I think it's east to west. Uh, but I'm not sure. It might be west to east. Um, but anyway, if you go from Goodview, Virginia towards Manita, you'll come up on Route 22. Well, you take that right. And if you take that right, seven or eight miles down the road, uh, is a bridge that goes over the lake. Some developers had made that into a marina and all sorts of different things. There was several, uh, restaurants there. Um, I ended even up working there, uh, a little while in the future and, uh, uh, doing like, uh, jet ski rentals and stuff like that. But it was called Bridgewater Plaza and, uh, and about two miles before you got to Bridgewater Plaza on the left was a, uh, residential development called, uh, Snug Harbor. Now Snug Harbor had a, well, today, if you look on Google Earth, it's very, it's, it's pretty developed now. Um, it was back then when we lived there, um, there was two, maybe three people that lived in that whole, that whole Snook Harbor uh, residential place. And, um, the rest of it was woods. Like it is like straight up dense woods. And, uh, well, anyway, so you turn off to the left into Snug Harbor and you go down this little road and you take another left and you go a couple miles out that way. And at the end of the cul-de-sac right to the left was our driveway and our, uh, our house was, my dad always used to call it the uh, gingerbread house because it was painted blue and all like the trimming and everything was white. And it looked just like a gingerbread house, but it was blue. Anyway, one night, my brother had went to one of his friend's house, which was about 15 minutes away. And uh, I was the only person that, that drove at that point. I think my dad had dropped him off earlier that day or earlier the day before. I can't remember. Uh, but my dad called me down. It was about 10 o'clock. He's like, hey, can you go get your brother? He's over at Tony's house. And I said, Sure. And, uh, so I got my stuff ready and everything and got in the car. I'd got, I had bought <laughs> that year. I was working on a job with my dad, um, with this, this place called Commonwealth Excavating and Pipeline. And I was doing a bunch of, uh, pipeline work and, uh, my car had, had spat out on me. So I had to find another one. And luckily one of my coworkers was selling his 1981 Toyota Celica Supra and it had a, a manual and I loved it. <laughs> I would take that thing up and down that, that dirt road that we lived on and just fishtail. I mean, all day. It was great. It was probably the funnest, the most fun car that I've ever owned. And it was built. I mean, it was built tough. Like, you know, we'd ran into several trees with it and it didn't even dent it. Uh, not at top speed, full speed or anything like that, just low speeds, but it still, it did not dent that car. But anyway, um, so I got in the car, started it up. I'm going out. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably 100, 200 
maybe maybe 250 yards out the road i'm still uh, a couple of miles from the uh from the left from the right turn that we had to get on the main road out of uh snug harbor and i started to hear uh the leaves and some branches crack uh, and I, ha- I had my windows about halfway down and I had the radio on just a tad, just a little bit, just for background ambience or whatever. But I he- heard something off to my right. And I, I didn't see anything. Uh, I may or may not have seen some eye shine. I don't know. Uh, my memory says that I might have, but I, I can't really say that I did. Um, but you could hear this thing walking, you know, uh, we had a lot of squirrels out there and squirrels were some of the noisiest animals out there in those woods. And you, you would think a a dang army was coming at you if there was enough squirrels playing in the leaves, you know? Uh, and I, I just brush it off. I was thinking, okay, well, that's just a squirrel or maybe it's even a deer, but it, it, it seemed kind of, Suspicious because it felt it. It sounded like bipedal movement. Um, swish, swish, swish. You know, had a cadence to it. But I kind of brushed it off, and you know, just like anybody with a a rational mind would, you know, and chalked it up as something else. So I continued on down the road, and. Went down the road, finally picked my brother up. And I told my brother, and I was like, man, I, th- I think there's some deer or something over. Uh, th- you know, I'm pretty sure I heard something over there uh, near the house. And he was like, well, maybe we'll see it when we get back in. You know, he was he was an animal lover. Um, my brother's past now, but he he was he, he was a, a he had a very bright soul. I mean, I loved him dearly. And then there was days where I hated him. I hated his guts, you know, but uh, he he was very fond of animals. And any time that there was mention of any kind of animal being sighted, he wanted to see it. And later on in his life, uh, he moved down to Florida. And this is kind of a funny thing, a tidbit here, but he moved down to Florida. And I went down to visit him for a little while. And he had jumped on the back of a baby alligator and drug it out of the swamp. I mean, he caught... All kinds of little things, and he used to post things on Facebook saying the catch of the week. And uh, he had this little baby duck one week, and then he found uh, several lizards and stuff like that. But anyway, that's kind of the person he was. But um, but as soon as I mentioned the deer, he's wanting to see it, you know. So we get back, and it wasn't quite to the spot where we were, where I was the first time I heard the noise. Uh, We were probably a good 400 yards 500 yards from that and this time i heard it on the right side which coming in would be the opposite side of what i heard it the first time i came out well i don't i can't remember what it was but uh we heard we heard something snap or something happened i can't remember uh but i was down in the floorboard either fishing for a cigarette or trying to get a CD. I cannot remember for the life of me, but Robbie said, Monty, stop the car. Look, 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 look. You got to see this thing, man. Look. And by, and when my eyes came up, I caught his face first. His face, I mean, was, oh, Lord. It looked like he had seen a ghost. But then I went from right to left with my eyes and I just caught the back end of this thing going out of the headlight range into the darkness. It had crossed in front of the car and my brother kept saying, dude, I think I just saw a Bigfoot or something or a monster. I don't know what that thing is, you know? And I and I was like, I, I don't know, man, because the only thing I saw was the back end of it, the back end of it being and I'll try to paint a, a, a good picture for you here. If you imagine you're on a, a dirt road, it's flat, but you have trees on both sides. It's a very narrow road. Uh, it's 
just about enough for two cars to pass. Um, and about 25 to 30 feet, maybe a little bit further in front of you, um, you know, you've got where your, your headlights shine. Well, my headlights were pretty messed up. They, they had been through the ringer. So they're very cloudy and I didn't have a very good shine on those things. So it was already dim and I had a hard time at night, you know, uh, looking out of the windshield, getting where I was going just because of how dim those things were in the first place. But when I saw this thing, the back half of its body was stepping out of the threshold of the light and where it was so dark and where my eyes, I guess, couldn't really adjust from light to dark that, that quickly. This thing seemed like it just vanished. Like it basically took one more step because I heard it. it. Well, I heard basically three steps, but only saw like a silhouette step the second time out of the light. But I'll go ahead and give you a description on what I saw. And we'll go from the, the feet up. The right leg of the creature was still in the headlights. It, like it, it had already stepped with its left foot into the darkness. Um, so the left foot I did not see. I didn't see its face. Uh, I didn't see the, like the, the first half of the front of its body. I didn't see that. But from, if you can imagine from maybe the middle of its rib cage on the side, or if you was to draw a line down a side profile of a creature like that, um, I saw the back end of that. Uh, now the thing was, all right. So from the feet up, the foot and, and I, I got to thinking about when, when we were talking the other night, uh, how I explained that foot, uh, to you and I got it backwards, uh, because <laughs> I, I looked up some feet of dogs and stuff like that. I don't have own a dog. So I looked up some, uh, you know, the legs and stuff like that. And what I, I'd, I'd actually explained to you the opposite of the way it was. So the way I explained before was that the, uh, the plantar grade uh, part of the front of the foot was longer and it was actually shorter. Uh, it was probably ten inches, ten inches long, and, and that's the front part where the toes touch the plantar grade end of it, and then. It comes up and then it comes up in an angle of not for, let's see, yeah, let's see, um, 90 degree would be, the, it, it would be a 45, uh, let's see, what's in between 45, probably a 20 degree angle from the flat part of the foot up. Okay. And then it angled back again in a, in a 45 degree angle. Of, like a square almost it went up into the where the knee area was and then it zigzagged back diagonally up into the thigh. Now I didn't see a tail on it. Uh, it didn't seem to have a tail, but the, the foot, the way that the fingernails were coming off of the foot or the toenails, the, I want to say that they looked like talons, um, but if you can imagine like a talon that's been uh, put on maybe a, like the pointy end, put it onto a grinder and kind of work it back and forth, like it'll kind of get that flat kind of uh, shape to it. It looked like the... Um, I could see the front, the big toe, the big toenail, and it would cut, it came straight off the toe and went straight down, like in a curved motion, straight down, curved over the end of the toe. And it looked like it had like been ground off, like as it stepped through the wilderness or whatever, like it had, it might have one time, if it would have put its legs up for uh, six months and never touched the ground, it probably would have sharp talons. But with it going through what it did, it, 
it, it made sense. Like when I thought about it later of why it looked that way, but I could see the, the first one and just a tad bit of the second one, but uh, the bottom of the feet, the uh, feet, feet the bottom of the feet uh did not have uh any kind of uh hair on it the skin color was like an ash like uh if you were to make a fire then later on you got the ash if you mix it up good that good that, that like matte gray kind of um color that's the color of the skin and then it had black very coarse hairs like coming from the top of like its foot. It was on the top of its foot and it almost looked like it was covering the side or whatever. But then when it came up, the foot uh, from where the plantigrade part was to the angled part where it came up into those uh, like the dog kind of bend or whatever. Um, it didn't have as much hair. It kind of thinned out a little bit. Uh, but then as it went up the calf portion, it started to get a lot of hair. And it started to go from like an inch of squiggly little raggedy hairs to pretty pretty coarse, pretty um, uh, thick hair. Uh, went up and then... Uh, then it, it just started getting the hairs just started getting longer and longer as it went up the body. But um it seemed the hair looked like it was like it almost like dreadlocked. Uh now I don't want to say it it looked like traditional dreadlocks because obviously, you know, it wouldn't look like that. But if you can imagine, um I'll I'll paint you, paint you another picture. We used to have a chow and uh, I was about three years old and um, we could not keep that thing groomed. Uh, it didn't matter how many times we brushed the things fur. It did not matter. It would get these clumps and these like cornrow looking things, matted, just matted hair clumped all together all over it all the time. And we just couldn't do it, you know, without shaving the dog completely, making it look ridiculous. That's what it looked like. But this this creature had that that stuff all over it, like especially right around like the waist and lower back. It had sticks and foliage and all kinds of stuff. It looked like it had gotten wet, got rolled around in the mud, like maybe stagnant pond mud. Okay, because that's a little bit thicker than normal mud, and uh, and got it all over him, and then went out into the sun got it baked on to him and then went and did the whole process again. And that's what it looked like. There was clumps of that stuff all over this thing. And the lower portion of its foot looked like it was wet. Like it, I could almost, I could, I could almost guarantee you that it left like a footprint of wetness. Now that's how far, how close we were to the lake. We had a uh, lake access, uh, that was not too far from there, a uh, couple hundred yards actually, and the direction it was coming from looked like it was coming from the lake. So, you know, that deducing all that, uh, I came to the conclusion that it was probably wading in the water, maybe looking for something before it it had come up and crossed our path. But the uh, the waste was small. But then it went up into a huge torso. Like this thing would make Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday look like a kindergartner. Like this thing, uh, its torso was huge. Like it, and really, I think when my eyes came up from the feet and saw that portion of the creature, that's really what started. That's that's what made my heart drop out of my chest. Was just the the sheer size of this thing. Um, now, as far as the arms go, I saw the back end of the left arm from about its midway down its um, bicep muscle area uh, down to its hand. Now. Its arms weren't as muscular as as what you would think. 
Um, the these things were like really long and, and spindly and it had like it's, it's hand was like almost curled up. Like it was in a, like a semi fist, but if it would have straightened its arm out from like the bent position that it had it in, it could have, it, it could have touched the ground. Like that's, and one of the reasons was, is because the posture of the animal was, it was, it almost reminded me of the hunchback of Notre Dame, like, um, that animated series on how that guy's posture was. That's what it looked like this thing was doing. Like it looked like the, from its waist, to where its rib cage started, like it was going straight up, but then it like bent over, like, like its shoulders were like pushed forward. Uh, and I could see the pointedness of an ear that looked like it was about six inches long. Um, trying to think of any kind of other details, um, I can think of. Uh, the hand, uh, it looked like a human's hand. The hand looked human. It had hair on top of the hand, on top of the finger, down to about the knuckle. And then, oh, and the, the, the toenail, uh, was, it was completely black, just like its fingernails were. Now its fingernails were a little bit longer than say a human's and they looked super thick. Like if you, if you had some force with his fingernails and put them on your fingernails and slashed at somebody, like it would rip your skin open. Like that's how thick and sharp these things looked. I don't really remember any other details. Uh, like I said, only saw, saw the back of it. Now my brother, my brother, uh, said that he saw the face of it and, uh, he said that it almost looked like, almost like a baboon snout, I guess. He said, but he really couldn't tell because he said the only reason why he, he, he said that is because the hair, you could kind of see it like the way it laid on top of it. But like he said, it looked like this thing had a mop on the top of its head. Like it, like a black mop. He said he had long flowing hair, but it was like all matted up and you couldn't see it's like face, face. He said he couldn't see his eye or his eyes. Um, but he did see like some stuff dripping from his mouth. Um, I think of any other detail I can give you. I can't really remember our conversation has been such a long time ago. Uh, if he was still alive, I'd ask him, but, uh, that's about all I can remember as, uh, uh, of details. Now, as soon as this thing stepped into the darkness, it took three more steps. The first step that he took out of the, the headlight, I could see the silhouette and then it disappeared. Uh, and when he, when I didn't see it, this thing was blacker than, than black. Like it almost looked like it could suck up all the blackness around it. Like it was so dark. Like it, it was, it was weirdly very, very strangely dark black. Anyway, I snapped out of it. You know, I'm sitting there frozen at this point and Robbie's. Robbie has already been telling me for <laughs> a couple of seconds, like, go, go, go. I didn't really even let it register until like this thing was out of my sight and I could actually, you know, concentrate on like what, what the heck happened, you know? And only thing I could hear was Robbie said, go, 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 go. So I hit the gas. I hit the gas and I uh, went first, second, third, fourth, and we probably. I mean, we were going at a, an unbelievable speed for that car and that road that I should have never, you know, it, it was very dangerous and I don't condone anybody to ever do that. But we got to the house and by the time we got there, dad and his girlfriend's asleep. So we never really had a chance to talk to him about that that night. Now, if he was awake, I would have definitely talked to him about it. But the next day, um, he'd gotten up in a bad mood and 
kind of set the mood for the day and I decided not to tell him that day. And I, from then on out, I just kind of left it, you know, why bring up something else and have him laugh at me again. I just didn't want to hear it, you know, and me and my brother stayed up all night that night talking about that thing. He, he drew a picture at one point and we lost it. I don't know where it ever went, but I'm right now as a, as I'm talking, <laughs> actually, um, working on my sketch of this thing. I want to, I'm doing a sketch of this, of what I saw the part of half his body being in the headlights, half of it, not uh, the dark road that we were going down. Um, I'm almost done with it. and uh, Hopefully it'll be a good rendition of what I saw, but um, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, from that point on, uh, me and my brother kind of talked about it here and there when we saw each other, but we never really told anyone else. Uh, uh, you know, what, what am I supposed to say? Yeah, we saw a monster. I mean, that's basically what it was. It was a monster. I didn't know what the heck it was, you know. And uh, up until a few days ago, I, I thought it was just a monster. And, you know, with some of the details and stuff that I've been kind of researching here lately, uh it falls into the, the dogman category. I mean, it, there's no doubt about it in my mind. But, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm not really sure, uh, what else to give you on that one. Uh, that's pretty much it. Really is a shame you had to go through those two experiences. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. I'm so sorry to hear about you losing Rob. How did he pass away? My father in 2012 passed away and left my brother and I his uh, mobile home. And I already had a home at that time, and my brother didn't. So I just went ahead and just gave it to him. And a couple months uh, after he moved in, him it was him and his fiance and his little winter dog. And, uh, well, anyway, uh, his stove was messed up. And a lot of people's stoves, where you turn the knob, there's like a safety thing to where you can't go from low directly to high. You have to go all the way around to get to that. Um, but there were something was messed up with the uh, stove eye, um one that he was using, and you could you could just bump it, and it would go directly from low to high, and it would just. There was a lot of times we'd caught it, you know, burning or whatever, and thank God it never did anything. But we turned it off there, and I don't know why he never got fixed, but he just didn't. But he had cooked, he had. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, crap. He had deep fried some corn dogs or whatever. And after he was done, he had bumped that thing. Uh, didn't know about it. His girlfriend or his fiance is in the shower. The dog is under the covers. Okay. You have to get from their bedroom past the kitchen to get to the uh, main outside door. But right. If you look right uh, directly across from the kitchen, there's a back door that you can kind of go out. It's like three or four feet, and you step, and you're outside on the back porch. Well, uh, he had left the thing on, uh, left the eye on accidentally. He's out in the garden picking some carrots while she's in the thing and saw some smoke come up. So he went in to see what was going on, and the whole house is basically filled up with smoke at this point. And he sees where, you know, the, the eye had caught the grease on fire. Well, he goes through the fire, basically. Well, it's not a huge fire at this point. He goes past the fire into the um, bedroom, uh, grabs a blanket off of his, um, his bed and threw it in the shower with her, told her what was going on, wrapped her up in that wet, blanket and basically carried her out of there, went back into the house, got the dog, saved him, went and put him outside with her, went back into the house. At that point, he had these, uh, you know how um, some pots and pans have that hard plastic handle? Well, that had gotten so hot that he figured 
he could just grab the 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 pot that was on fire, take those three steps to the back door and throw it out, and it it that would be that. Well, when he grabbed that handle, it melted onto his hand, and he proceeded to drop this grease fire, and it went all over him. And basically went like his whole right side of his body from his um, pectoral muscle down um, was third degree burned. They flew him to, I think it was Duke University to the burn center. And he stayed there for months. And finally, he beat it like from everybody's miracle. He beat it. But. Uh, with him having so much skin and everything burnt off of him, he, he easily got MRSA. And the MRSA, he, he, he fought it and battled it for like a year and almost died several times. But finally, finally, uh, beat that. Well, a few late uh, years later, I was telling you he moved to Florida. Well, he moved down to Florida and he asked me to come down there, um, and spend, the last couple months with him because he had talked to the doctor and, and the MRSA was back and there's, there wasn't any way he could stop it. Uh, it was just so bad that even the, uh, the uh, super antibiotics that they were giving him just, it was just sustaining him. And if he was to miss one day of it, the sepsis would basically take over his body. And, uh, uh, I was, uh, it, I went up to visit my mom in Virginia and his fiance called and said, Hey, he's in the hospital. He's not breathing. He's on everything. And I told her, I was like, put him, put him on the phone. I spoke my piece to him. She said, I don't think he's going to make it. And within an hour or two, she called back and he was gone. Uh, and that's, that's how that worked, man. That was pretty bad. He, you know, he saved her and saved the little RC, his little wiener dog, and then saved my dad's house. I mean, he he was so worried about that house that he gave him that he, you know, had to go back in. Instead of just letting it burn up and collecting insurance money, he wanted the house that dad left. So that's how he explained it to me. Wow, Monty, I am so sorry. Your brother, oh, though, he was a hero. <laughs> Yeah, he was. I, I really regarded him as that. Yeah, he, it was brave. He was brave, man. I don't know if I could have went in there. He said it was roaring in there too, man. I just don't know if I could have done it. Oh, I bet it was roaring. Well, you know, like I said, he really was a hero. God bless him. Thank you. Oh, no, you're welcome. Just tell it like it is. Well, Monty, I've got a laundry list of questions to ask you, but. We're out of time. Would you be up for coming back for a part two next week? Yes, I would. Yes, I, w- I would love that. That would be my honor to come on here. We'll do that then. We'll bring you back and I'll have tons of questions for you and we'll take it from there then. All right, then. All right. Well, as always, thanks again so much for your time and have a great night. <laughs>